Okay, let's proceed. Chair, to address your first query in relation to the terms of office of the Minister of Police and the National Commissioners of Police, our investigator was kind enough to extract two pages of a presentation at the start of the stream, which by your leave I asked that I could hand up. Okay. Thank you. And then, Chair, in relation to the High Court judgment, which is the full freedom under law judgment, which is at tab 8 under KK 2.4 of, of this bundle, it was Justice Murphy who handed down the, handed down the decision and essentially the decisions that were sought to be reviewed related to decisions concerning General Nkluli. It in particular then concerned the review and set aside of those decisions. In that regard, the High Court had set aside three decisions. The first decision was the decision the, to withdraw the disciplinary proceedings, Correct, Chair. the withdrawal of the discipline proceedings and his reinstatement, and then the withdrawal of the criminal charges. Correct, Chair. And it's those particular criminal charges, which are the fraud and corruption charges, that this witness speaks to in relation to General Nflule and Colonel Barnard. Yes. There was also a decision taken to withdraw 17... Um, criminal charges by Advocate Chauke, but having said that, the High Court also granted an order, which was an interdict, to reinstate the criminal charges against General Mkluli, and so to reinstate the disciplinary proceedings against General Mkluli, yes. in addition to ancillary orders. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court of Appeal, through Justice Brandt, confirmed the setting aside of the decisions in relation to the withdrawal of the corruption and fraud charges against General Nkluli, so too the decision to withdraw the disciplinary proceedings against General Nkluli, and so too the decision to reinstate Nkluli as the head of crime intelligence. So all those three were then set aside. However, the court was not prepared to confirm the orders which um, called for the reinstatement um, sorry, the, the court did not agree with the ordering of the interdicts to reinstate because it found that the interdicts were inappropriate transgress transgressions of the separations of power doctrine. It also went so far as to not agree with the setting aside of Advocate Chauke's decision to withdraw those 17 criminal charges, but what it did do is that it gave effect to the NDPP's undertaking to decide which of those 17 charges, which included murder and related crimes, which were withdrawn, are to be reinstituted, and to make that decision known to freedom under law within two months of the order, and to provide any reasons if it doesn't reinstitute any of those charges, in addition to ancillary mm, Okay, no, that's fine. If we could then continue at page 19 of this witness's affidavit. And that's bundle KK 2.1 for the record. Mr. Rulof, so what happened on the 18th of October 2011? I think your mic is off. Chair, on that specific date, um, I had an arrangement to see uh, one Colonel Naidu, D.G. Naidu. He worked at Crime Intelligence, and uh, from the documentation that I received from Crime Intelligence, um, as part of the, the request for, for, for documents from them, I received seven files relating to, the, uh, relating to specific agents that were appointed within the 250 
um, uh, appointment, uh, which we refer to as the 250 appointments. Um, in respect of those files, I was able to establish that this Colonel Naidu was the person that actually dealt with uh, these individuals, as well as do, uh, did the administration surrounding their work at crime intelligence uh, within the agent program. So based on that, I requested Colonel Naidu to come and see me, and I interviewed him. Um, I also interviewed him regarding the trip to Singapore, which, which I alluded to earlier. And, um, and I confronted him with the documentation that I had in my possession. Colonel Naidu, from, um, from uh, my uh, understanding... One second. Sorry. Yes. Colonel Naidu, from my understanding and from what he's told me, he reported he worked for General Lazarus uh, within the uh, operational group which I have earlier coined, and he reported directly to General Lazarus. And how exactly would you describe the relationship, as he described it to you, between <coughs> Colonel Naidu and General Lazarus? Um, Colonel Naidu described to me that he is that he is friends with General Lazarus, and that they are that they are related in terms of family, uh, albeit um, not closely, but they are related in terms of their family, uh, family relationships. So um, he knew him, and he worked with him for at that point in time for quite some time. He was also General uh, General Lazarus was all instrumental in bringing him from KwaZulu Natal to Gauteng, where he can work for him uh, at the, at the Crime Intelligence Office. And what transpired then at the interviews that you held with Colonel Naidu? Um, I interviewed him. He was actually quite forthcoming in the, in the, in, on the 18th. Uh, but I could also um, see that he was reluctant uh, to fully disclose as to what his role was and what, uh, where he was involved in. Um, I then said to him, I concluded that interview for, the interview for that day and I asked him to come back the next day, which he did. Um, I then spoke to him on the 19th. And, uh, and the 19th of which month? Sorry, 19th of October, that was the next day, um, the 19th of October 2011. And he then decided, he made a decision to assist me with the investigation, uh, Colonel Naidu. And as part of that, he, he briefed me and he told me uh, about allegations that was uh, allegations in respect of the abuse of the Secret Services account, as well as his own role in the abuse of the fund. He then, he, um, he then went on that, according to me, he went on that day, he went back to his office. This is now after he decided to assist me and he, and he, he alluded to certain things. Obviously it wasn't an extensive list, but he started to cooperate. He then confided in um, he confided in Colonel Barnett on that day, uh, which is the 19th, according to me. And, um, and that is the 19th of October. 19th of October, 2011. Sorry, sorry, chair. And um, on that same day, he was fetched from his home uh, by uh, General. Uh, Le well, not General Lasses. This is now where I come to come to mention the the code names or the the numbers. Oh yes, okay. And it was it was FM08 and FM09 that came to fetch him from his home. MF9. Yeah, uh, FM08 and FM09. Okay, okay. They came to fetch him from uh, at his at his residence. Yes. They took him to the residence of General Lazarus, the private residence of General Lazarus. And they wanted to know from him, uh, or what, they accused him that, he, that they know for a fact that he is working with the, uh, with the DPCI. And uh, they wanted to know from him what he told the DPCI, meaning now me. Uh, an additional individual in, um, um, uh, also came there, um, which I 
uh, marked as FM 10, 1010, and they he joined them at General Lessons as Ram. Uh, Colonel Naidu, according to him, he denied the allegation that he was working with the DPCI because he's, he thought that would be prudent at the time that he didn't know what they want to do with him, so he denied that he was working with us. Uh, it was during that conversation that um, that FM10 also told him that the Hawks informed him that, and I don't know who these Hawks are, that Colonel Nider admitted to certain things and it is now on the side of the DPCI. Colonel Nider um, told me that he again denied the allegations and he was, and he was able to deflect the suspicion uh, regarding uh, the accusations. Uh, he then states to me that the conversation um, then turned to general topics and at some stage they talk about uh, a company called Westfield Travel and air tickets that were purchased through that company. Um, <coughs> FM08 FM then says that, uh, according to Naidu, that Ankle requested certain documentation from him regarding the air tickets. FM10 and F, FM10 told then, according to Naidu, FM08, that he must try and destroy the records pertaining to the air tickets. Uh, on the 20th, October 2011, that during the discussion on the 19th, he was. Um, on the 19th at General Lassus' home, that he, that he heard them discussing a placement of a newspaper article in the, um, relating to General Dramat and General Sabia. Uh, and it is an article regarding, um, regarding the rendition matter that General um, Dramat was later um, accused of. He said that uh, General Lassus wanted to use sources within the media to write the story in order to take the focus away from them. This, according to Colonel Naidu, is a strategy employed to cast suspicion on those perceived to be a threat. General Lazarus viewed Dramat, General Dramat as, as the head of the DPCI, as the force behind the investigation into crime intelligence. Uh, I was in, I informed General uh, Dramat at the time uh, of what was told to me, and then a newspaper article um, appeared on the 23rd of uh, October 2011 in the Sunday Times. General, um, <coughs> General Maduli, Maduli, in terms of his representation, uh, and I'm jumping a little bit here, uh, he made a representation to the NPA with regards to his um, prosecution. Part of that representation uh, indicated that there's a conspiracy against him and that um, and uh, and they they used that, according to Naidu, to to uh, cast suspicion on General Dramat and the investigating team. Uh, so these newspaper articles, the, the information is leaked to, to cast suspicion on individuals that wants to do their work. Uh, as I said, on the 23rd of um, October 2011, this newspaper article surfaced in the Sunday Times. Uh, I wasn't aware that the newspaper, newspaper article will be published in the Sunday Times. That wasn't said. He didn't know that. He just said the newspaper article will be published. And then I, later on, I became aware that the Sunday Times published an article on the 13th of October. Uh, no, at the later stage, I became aware that the Sunday Times published a further article. Or must I, I rephrase that, a, a, an initial article on the 13th of October, which I didn't know about at the time. Uh, continuing to implicate General Dramat in the rendition scan scandal. See, and, and I've got that as Annex KDR 4 to my statement. Um, Miss September, the witness wants to, wants guidance from you. Humble apologies, Chair. I was just thinking to read. I just need to know whether I should go to KDR 4, uh, the, the Annex to this. To paragraph 59.1. In fact, um, 
since you are in that cage. The, in, the information and intelligence that you then received through Colonel Naidu, is it correct then that such intelligence proved true through the publications in the newspapers which you are wanting to refer to? That is correct, uh, Chair. Um, the information that he provided to me uh, indicated about the rendition article um, implicating General Sabia and General Dramat, and that is what I then subsequently found in the article of dated the, 20th, the 23rd of October 2011. And can I ask you then to turn to page 104 <coughs> of the same bundle, please? And on the left-hand side, you have a title called Hawks and SA Police Arresting Suspects and Sending Them Over the Border to be Murdered. Um, is that the article that you were referring to? That's the article I'm referring to, which I then, <coughs> excuse me, which I took to be the article that uh, Colonel Lydu was referring to. And Chair, um, the same article has been typed up in a bit more of legible terms on page 105 to 106. Okay. Is it correct then that there was a further article that was published on the 13th of October 2012 along the same lines? Yeah, you know, it wasn't the further article. I presume that was the first article. This is the further article, the Oops, one on the 23rd. Humble apology. I'm, I'm getting my dates confused. If we could turn to then page 108. And again, on the far left-hand side, you have an article titled Dramat to be interrogated over claims that he facilitated illegal deportation of men who were tortured and killed in Zimbabwe headed up by the bigger heading of Hawke's boss fingered in the rendition scandal. Is that the article that you referred to? That is the article that I referred to, which I subsequent to um, neither informing me about the 23rd of uh, October 2011 article, which I then went back and I saw this article, which, which was uh, published on the, on the 13th of October 2013. And Chair, once again, as with the previous article, this is too being typed up in a more legible format, format on page 109 and 110. What then happened on the 21st of October 2011, Mr. Rolofsa? On the 21st of October, <coughs> uh, I, was, I was called by Colonel Naidu. Um, he was quite upset at the time. And uh, I then went to see him. Uh, during our, dis our discussion there, he said he was again fetched from his home that morning and taken to the crime intelligence offices where Barnat, FM07 and FM10 were present. Uh, and he felt unsafe. Uh, that same evening, I placed Colonel Naidu together with his family in the witness protection program. Uh, to alleviate his, his, uh, his concern regarding his, his uh, safety. And that was now the second or the third attempt um, of intimidating uh, Colonel Naidu at that point in time. At paragraph 61, you talk to the authority of Lazarus to to release funds from the Secret Services account and his relationship, or alleged relationship rather, with reporters and lawyers. Can you please amplify on that? Um, Chair, I can only state here, and as I stated in this, effort, in this paragraph, I can state what, what Colonel Naidu has told me and then subsequent what I found afterwards. Now, Colonel Naidu has informed me that um, General Lazarus had the authority to release funds from the SSA, which is a fact. He has that, he has that um, authority. Uh, he was able to control funds being paid to sources and contact persons, which is also correct. Uh, he then states that reporters are used to publish and withhold 
articles to drive a certain narrative. Um, according to Colonel Neider, these reporters are paid from the Secret Service's account. I'm also aware that General Lazarus used funds from uh, the Secret Service account to directly appoint defense lawyers to represent him after the search, search warrants were issued in respect of the two CI officers and um, I refer to the date of the 6th September, 6 September 2011, um, which were eventually not executed by agreement. How do you know this about the use of funds from the Secret Service's account to appoint defense lawyers? Chair, at the time I sat in the car, the, the call came through to Colonel Falun, and we were on our way to a meeting, as I alluded earlier, at Oliver Tamba with General Libya and General Dramat and General um, Sibia. And um, there was an instruction or there was a communication from the defense lawyer who spoke on the phone and I heard the conversation that was on loudspeaker that he said he was appointed by uh, crime intelligence uh, to, um, to represent them in terms of the search and seizure warrants that were issued. Uh, and I did not, I didn't take any notice of the call. I said, We're not, we, we, won't be, we won't be talking to them. Because that, wasn't the, that was not the proper procedure that, that was followed. He ought to have gone to uh, the SAP's, uh, SAP's legal services uh, to, to appoint lawyers through the state's attorney's office uh, and not directly approach us. That is the proper way of dealing with, with uh, that kind of representation. In my view, there was no legal basis to challenge those warrants, and I am of the opinion that um, the payment for, uh, for these uh, legal representatives came from the Secret Services account. Is it your opinion or is it fact? From, um, I have, I had, um, I thought about this again after, after, um, after making the affidavit. I cannot state it as a fact. I know what he said. He said that he is, a, he is representing the, the, the crime intelligence. Um, I took that as a fact that crime intelligence is paying him. And so whilst it may be that you are aware that there were certain defense lawyers that were involved in the issue relating to the search warrants, you do not know for a fact that state funds through the Secret Services account was used to pay those lawyers? No, I'm not. Um, and uh, I base my, my opinion uh, on, the, on the conversation that I heard on the telephone, on, on the telephonic call. At paragraph 62 of your affidavit, you talk about certain communications with the chairperson of the Joint Standing Committee on Intelligence, Mr. Cecil Burgess. That is correct, Chair. Can you please elaborate on this further and how you came to learn of this information? This information came via General Hankel, who was appointed as the, um, let's call him the liaison officer between myself and Crime Intelligence. He, he said to me that uh, General Lazarus approached the, uh, the approached the chairperson of the Joint Standing Committee on Intelligence, uh, Mr. Cecil Burgess, on various occasions without notifying the acting Div divisional commissioner who was uh, General Machachi at the time. Uh, General Lazarus was a penalty, according to General um, Ankel, trying to convince Mr. Burgess that the investigation that uh, we are conducting are compromising national security. A letter from Mr. Burgess stating that General Ankel must be removed from the investigation was sent to the acting divisional commissioner of CI, which was General Machachi, and I have had sight of that letter. In fact, there was more than one letter uh, requesting um, General Machachi to take removed General Henkel from, uh, from assisting us. Was General Henkel's continuation in the matter affected at all? Uh, one second. Um, I ask that they switch off the aircon because I have a little bit of flu. 
but I want to check. I don't want to punish people and in case it's too hot already. Um, are people feeling that they, they should, we should switch it on? Uh, okay, I get an indication that it's manageable. Okay, thank you. What yes. Thank you, Chair. What happened with General Henkel's involvement in the investigation, or continued involvement with the investigation? His continued involvement was terminated. He was not allowed to, to um, assist me any further, and he was transferred out of crime intelligence, together with General uh, uh, Sintimule and um, General Machachi at the time. And then what was the consequence of General Henkel's removal from the investigation to your, the investigations that you were conducting? How did it impact your investigation? Chair, um, I received documentation through General Henkel on request um, as part of the agreement that was uh, set down in August. Uh, with his removal, I did not receive any further documentation from crime intelligence. I did not receive any further assistance from crime intelligence in respect of the investigation. It stopped there. Is it correct that you, together with Colonel Fu Yun, obtained additional search and seizure warrants? That is correct, Chair. And in relation to which matters or investigations, rather, did you obtain these? search and seizure warrants? Chair, as in, as, um, uh, when you continue with the investigation, if you, can't, if you cannot get your documentation from that source, you, you go then to, you, you try to take a, another route. Uh, we knew that in instances, or certain instances, that they made use of private companies. They cannot, um, those companies cannot um, use the excuse of classified documentation, because the documents aren't classified. So we, um, we applied for certain seizure warrants on some of those companies. One of them would have, uh, is a company, well, as part of that application for the certain seizure, I also applied for access to um, IT equipment, computers, hard drives, in, um, et cetera. Now, at the time, the, the unit that dealt with um, with uh, that investigation, or the unit that I would approach to assist me to to, um, to to seize the those those equipment from a crime scene, was based within crime intelligence, and they worked under the direct command of General Lazarus. And um, <clears throat> what we have found is that. As part of the procedure that was followed within crime intelligence, that commander of that unit, uh, which is called the technical support unit, had to inform General Lazarus of each and every, as part of his normal course of duties, uh, of each and every certain seizure that they're going to take part in. So I found myself in a position where the very person that I'm investigating is now being reported to in terms of uh, a certain seizure that I want to go and do in terms of people that's been in, implicated with him in wrongdoing. Um, <clears throat> if I can then take you to tab 5, Annex 5, which starts at page 113 of your bundle. Please identify this document. Uh, Chair, I, I drew up this document in, uh, in the period between February and March, beginning of March 20, 2012. This document was born out of the fact that I, um, at that time I was quite uh, despondent. I didn't know what was going on. I couldn't. Uh, uh, the matters were withdrawn in the, in the High Court as well as the Regional Court. The reasons didn't make sense to me. And it seems to me that, uh, it seemed to me at the time that um, we are not fighting necessarily the individuals that are involved in the criminality, but 
officials within within government or within the NPA and SAPS um, to get these people to book, and that is that's <coughs> one of the reasons why I drew up this uh, this report. And as part of the report, I then listed certain incidents as to what we try to do um, to make sure that this matter stays on the court roll uh, and to get it back onto the court roll. So if we can then pause here. It's correct that you were brought on board to lead up the investigation into what you call the Fosslurus matter. That is correct, Chair. And it's also then correct that through your investigations in the Fosslurus matter, you had discovered additional information which related to the Secret Services account, and in particular the looting of the Secret Services account. That is correct, Chair. And you obtained this information through several members that you interviewed, some of which you obtained affidavits, others of which you just interviewed. That is correct, Chair, uh, of which the most important would then be, at the end of the day, Colonel Naidu, which I interviewed. And the information that you then received from Colonel Naidu, did that information lead to... Um, various investigations that is correct chair that uh, that triggered various investigations relating to the information that is provided that he had provided to me at the time can i then ask you to turn to exhibit kk 2.3 which is the diagrams bundle page two um diagram two the, the diagrams bundle, yes. Page two. Page two or diagram two? Sorry? Page two or diagram two? Diagram two, sorry. Can we project it, please? Is this a fair representation of the investigations that you have been involved in and led? Uh, it is, yes, yes, Chair, it is a fair representation. And is it correct then that through the evidence that you've given to this Commission, your entry investigation into the Secret Services account was the Mkluli Fosluras case, as you've termed it to be? That is correct, Chair. And out of your investigations in that matter, at least 11 investigations have ensued. That is correct, Chair. Are these the investigations that you will now specifically talk to? That is correct, Chair. And who has been the main source of information for these investigations that you have led? That would be Colonel Naidu, together with um, our independent investigations into Atlantis Motors. Okay. If we can then turn to turn back to page twenty two. Having looked at that diagram now, which lists eleven investigations, is that an exhaustive list of all the investigations that arose out of the information you obtained from Colonel Naidu? No, Chair, it's not, it's not an exhaustive list. I deal with these because I have, I was able to corroborate either fully or to a, to a certain extent uh, what uh, Colonel Lido has said to me in terms of these investigations. There are others, other investigations which I could not conduct. I never received the documentations which I, documentations which I requested from Crime Intelligence to finalize those investigations. On page 23, paragraph 66, you talk specifically to an engagement that you had with General Motiba during late 2011 or early 2012. Can you please elaborate on that to the Chair? And how it came about that you had this engagement? 
Chair, um, right from the start, when I, when I sp just after I spoke to, uh, to Colonel Naidu, I involved, gen involved General Henkel in my discussions because I did not want to be seen as, um, as irresponsible when working with uh, this kind of, in, in this environment. So General Henkel was aware of what Naidu said. He was present during um, one uh, during the, uh, some of these, um, these these briefings that we had. As part of that, um, General General Henkel also reported back through his structures, and I reported back through my structures through General Dramat as to what we have uncovered. And then, based on that, I was approached by um, by Brigadier De Villiers Wittendal who works for the Legal Services Department at, at, at the National Office from for SAPS. He then introduced me to uh, General Motiba, who was at the time the head of detectives. And he then said to me that um, uh, they want to come and see me so that I can brief them in terms of what we have uncovered. Uh, they came, they flew down to Cape Town and, they, and I went to see them. And uh, I informed them about the information that I received from, from uh, Colonel Nigel. And, uh, and the information that I received from Colonel Nigel mainly, uh, mainly concerns the provinces of KwaZulu-Natal, Gauteng, and the Western Cape. A decision was taken that the disciplinary investigations into those allegations would be dealt with with General Motiba, and hence the reason why he came to see me. Um, in order to inform and debrief him on, in terms of what was said to me. And uh, I was then later informed that uh, um, Brigadier Simon Matansela and uh, Captain Ramesh Yeralal were appointed to, do the con to conduct the disciplinary and criminal investigations which relate to KwaZulu-Natal. And there was, um, I asked for that because I was not in a position to go to KwaZulu-Natal also and investigate there when I'm busy in Gauteng. So that is how that came about and um, why General Matiba came to see me. And so then it was Brigadier Simon Madonzela and Captain Ramesh Yeralal whose focus area was to address matters within the KwaZulu-Natal region. That's correct, together with the disciplinary matters that was um, supposed to be instituted. And that, just to make sure I understand, when we're talking about matters within KwaZulu-Natal, we're talking about, as you've mentioned, the disciplinary matters that were within that region, in addition to any investigations relating to the Secret Services account arising out of that region. That is correct, uh, Chairperson. It, it, it arose from the information given to me by, by Colonel Naidu. Can we now address the investigations um, one by one. The first one being, as you've termed it, one-stop travel and tours, Durban, flight arrangements between late 2009 to October 2011. What is important is for us as the Commission to understand what you did with the information that you received from Colonel Naidu and what the outcome was of the specific investigation that you led in relation to each matter. And with that in mind, can I ask you to please clarify to the Chair as to what Colonel Naidu told you in relation to this investigation? I will do so, Chair. Um, but, uh, when it comes to the first part of this uh, narrative, or, or my affidavit, um, it basically relates to what Naidu, Colonel Naidu has told me. So, uh, what he has informed me is that on several occasions he had to arrange for General Madluli and his wife, Mrs. Lyons, and two children to fly up to, jo to Johannesburg and back to Cape Town. And these visits were private in nature and they were paid for by the Secret Service account. Um, <coughs> The Secret Service, Secret Service account may be utilized to pay air tickets in as far as it is for agents and informers on an official um, crime intelligence business, but not for private matters. Flights for General Madrid were also paid out of the Secret Service account 
and these flights were also private in nature, according to Colonel Naidu. General Madluli was not allowed to was not allowed to travel utilizing SSA funds, as his flight should have been financed through the SS, uh, South African Police Service open budget. On that on that point, you say it ought to have been financed through the SAP's open budget, but you also say that it needed to have only been for official business. Uh, there's, there's a distinction. Under, under what circumstances can Secret Services account funds be used? to fund air travel for its members? Please uh, clarify. Um, Chair, for instance, if an agent had, has to, agent is based in Cape Town, he has to come up to Johannesburg uh, to attend a meeting with, uh, with the source of his or to attend a meeting with uh, a crime grouping or whatever the case may be. That is, that is official in nature. Uh, this, you will get, funds will be uh, withdrawn from the Secret Service account and the uh, air ticket would be bought. Um, he would fly down, he will go back up, uh, back down to Cape Town, and um, that cost was, is bared by the um, Secret Service's account. Uh, it also follows that you will find that there's a memo or information note after such a trip um, s um, stating what had happened and what the information was that was retrieved during that. Um, during that engagement. So in that, I in that <coughs> instance, it has happened before and it will happen again because there's nothing wrong with that. But it is not there for the utilization of private trips. When it comes to General Madluli, as the head of crime intelligence, he's not a, he's a public figure. He's not an agent. And as such, um, he must make use of the open account. Uh, you can't fly to Durban and state that it is for a, um, it is for, um, it's on a COVID operation because he's a public figure, he's known. So it would not, it would not assist him um, that, uh, that he flies with, uh, on the Secret Services account. But that, I'm not saying he can't, I'm just saying it is, it is, it, it is not the norm. And not, it should not advisable. Happen. It's not, not advisable. advisable. Yes, yes, Chair. Mm because he's got other means to pay for that, for that official trip. Were there any other individuals who benefited from air travel, according to Colonel Naidu? According to Colonel Naidu, uh, General Lazarus um, benefited from, from the air travel. Um, then a pastor from the, from the African Dream Center. Can I just correct that? We've been informed that it's not the African Dream Center, but the African Dream Family Church. Please Thank continue. You. Uh, what about is that? It's the last line on page 23 in paragraph 68. The commission oh, is... It, it's, yeah, what is the correct name? The commission received a letter from them which informed that it's African Dream Family Church. Oh. And not African Dream Center. Oh, okay. So you got that correct in the supplemental. As it pleases, Chief. Okay. Do you know anything about African Dream Family Church? I do know that General Lazarus is a, um, is a member of that specific church. But once yeah. again, this is information that you received from Colonel Naidu. Yes, I received that information from him, and I was able to uh, confirm it at a later stage. What was the process that you understood in how flight to accommodation bookings were made? Uh, Chair, according to Colonel Naidu, you would, uh, in respect of the bookings that he made, when he dealt with... Um, family members of General Madluli, he would phone the cons consultant at a, let's call it a satellite office of One Stop Travel and Tours, which is called Westfall Travel. He would speak to uh, one Mahesh Parekh. Uh, Mr. Parekh would, um, would then make a booking on his behalf in respect of the individual that wants to fly. He would make that booking through the parent company, which is One Stop Travel and Tours. Uh, the booking would be made, the, the ticket will be bought, 
and uh, an invoice would be sent to Westful Travel. Westful Travel and they on, uh, via Mr. Parekh would then create his own in invoice, which he would then forward to Company X. Company X would then pay One Stop Travel and Tours uh, into their account. Uh, the, uh, what we have, uh, when we found the, the various invoices, we were able to establish that there was um, a lot of large over invoicing of company X as part of this whole process to create a credit on the company account within the books of uh, One Stop Travel and Tours. So, having received this information from Colonel Naidu, what was the outcome of your investigations into such information? Uh, based on his information, we, uh, we again applied for the citizen seizure warrant, which was, um, which was uh, given to us. Um, I also received remittance advices, for remittance advices from General Henkel relating to payment from Company X to One Stop Travel and Tours. And, um, and according to the General Ledger account uh, from Company X, more than a million rand has been paid to One Stop Travel and Tours since, uh, as from March 2010 up until the date that we did the search and seizure, which was in I think the 1st of November, or very cool. On the 25th of, 21st, 25th of November, 20, uh, not November, October 2011. So during that year and six months, uh, more than a million rand has been paid to One Stop Travel and Tours in terms of air tickets. But were you able to establish whether or not all of that funding was part of a scheme which ought not to have taken place? Yes, Chair, I was. Um, in between, we did find that agents did actually travel. And, um, but the majority of the funding didn't go, uh, weren't used by agents um, in the official capacity. Or I would assume that when an agent flies, it will be within his official capacity. So I didn't take that any further, but we're talking about uh, family members and um, and friends that uh, that made use of this account to fly. In fact, Mr. Parikh uh, also saw it fit to fly his own family and friends to various parts of the country, uh, paid for by the Secret Service account. So, on the one hand, your investigation was sourced from remittance advices that you received from Jindal <coughs> Hankel. That's correct. On the other hand, you also obtained a search and seizure warrant on the 25th of October 2011. That is correct, uh, Chair, and, and, based on the, and, and during that search and seizure, we were able to, to, um, to seize the documents relating to the account uh, with the invoices and, and so forth from Westville Travel as well as One Stop Travel and Tours. Please give a little bit more detail in relation to what happened on the execution of such search and seizure warrant obtained on the 25th of October 2011. Chair, when, um, when I arrived there and, and General Henkel was with me and a few other members, uh, Mr. Parekh was waiting for me in, in the office. And uh, next to him was a bundle of documents. And uh, he said to me that he was told to prepare these documents for me. Now, we didn't tell anyone that we are coming through uh, or that we are planning to search this, this specific premises. Um, he had a copy for himself and a copy for me uh, available. And uh, I, I then asked him, you know, who informed him that I was going to search the premises? And his um, answer to me was uh, FM08 that informed him. At a later stage, I obtained an affidavit from Mr. Parikh. He says that, and I'm quoting from his affidavit, between 19, this, between 19 and 20 October 2011, I received a call from F FM08. He told me that personnel from jo Johannesburg or Pretoria would be coming down to uh, Durban to pick up the invoices from Company X and keep them, and keep them ready. He also told me that to add the name of the travelers to the invoices before I print it. I had to give these invoices to the personnel from Johannesburg or Pretoria. 
FM08 also requested me not to reflect the names of the following passengers on the invoices. And in that sense, he reflects them to FM01, Sentimule, Mashudu, Darren Lazarus, Sandra Lazarus. He then states further, he did not get around to doing that, and um, in, in other words, he did not, he did not um, take it, he did not take it out from the invoices. What was your assessment after reconciling the documents you received through the search and seizure warrant with the documentation or remittance advices that you received from General Hankel? Um, uh, financially, it's the following. I was able to establish the check payments from Company X uh, to one sub table and two between April 2010 and 25 October amounted to 1.168531 million, 1,168,531 million cents. Um, that was as per their worksheet. And then I was able to establish that in terms of General Madluli, General Lazarus, and Mr. Marimutu, uh, regarding services rendered for their air travel, General Madluli and his family, it was a 306,919 rand, rand, General Lazarus and his family was 160,124 rand, and Mr. Marimutu was 215,131 rand. And that's a total of 682,174 rand, which is more than half uh, the total amount that was paid to uh, uh, paid from from Company X. And that was for the period April, April 2010 to 25 October 2011. That is correct, Chair. Was there anything else that you established? through that reconciliation process relating to identities of passengers? Yes, Chair, I was able to establish um, that uh, on at least one occasion, the children of General Madluri did actually um, fly. Uh, the actual passenger was, was the children. And uh, when looking at the documentation from crime intelligence, which I received, the remittance advices and the invoices that were submitted to them, um, attached to that um, bundle of documents, there is a key, which I call a key. Uh, the key would then would be filled in by FM08. The key would inform the Auditor General that a specific invoice, which is nameless uh, in terms of a passenger, was actually used for that agent or that agent, and giving the agent number. Now, in respect of the children, um, the, the misrepresentation that was made to um, the employer is the fact that the children flew as, uh, as agents, as if they were agents. It was claimed as if it was agents that flew. Were you able to establish who authorized payments for these air travel? Um, Chair, we weren't able to get all the documentation because we were in the middle of getting that documentation when my when General Hankel was transferred. Um, so I didn't receive everything, but the ones that I do have were signed by uh, by General Lazarus were as the CFO of the uh, SSA fund. Were there any other police officials who benefited from air travel? through this particular organization? Yes, Chair. Um, in this regard, uh, General Sintimuli, Sintimula, uh, and her husband um, benefited through that, as well as General Machachi benefited through that. Um, however, there is a, um, an explanation given to them. They testified subsequently in the disciplinary hearing of Mr. Lazarus and they explained what had happened there, which I will inform the, uh, the commission, later, commission later. Please do so now. Okay. Uh, according to both General um, Sintimule as well as General um, Machachi, they received calls from Mr. Marimutu, uh, inviting them to come and visit or attend church in KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, it happened on more than one occasion, and in terms of uh, General um, 
St. Muli, she went there with her husband uh, on more than one occasion, and General Machachi, I think, once with his family, his wife and, and kid. And uh, they were under the impression, uh, and that impression, according to him, was, um, was given to them by Mr. Marimutu that the church are paying for these expenses. And when they, when they do go over, it will be, go, do go to Durban, it will be on the expense of the, on the account of the church. Um, and General Lazarus did not inform them that actually, the, that, actually that, uh, um, that the Seeker Service account uh, paid for those uh, actual trips. So they were, as I explained earlier, they were placed in a position where these things could be used against them at a later stage without their knowledge. You mentioned earlier that General Mgluli, for the period of April 2010 to 25 October 2011, benefited in the sum of 306,919 rand. And that is not only for General Mkluli, but his family too, which that amounted correct, to more than half of the total budget for that period. That is correct, Chair, if you, if you, if you um, add all three of them together. Did General Mkluli have access well, is, is it more than half? Yeah, it's more than half, Chair. Hmm? It is more than half. Are you talking about the figures on page 26? Oops, sorry, sorry, my mistake. Oh, am I ahead of you? No, no. No, no. In fact, Chair, you are in fact correct. The yes. total amount but of 600... 306... 306,000 uh, rand, are you saying is about 50% of 682? No, in fact, Chair, I made the, I made the mistake, and thank you for correcting me. Um, it's actually the total amount of 682, which is in excess of half of the total amount. So okay. I retract. Okay, just repeat that. I just want to make sure I, okay. I don't misunderstand what you're saying. I retract that statement. And my, what I would like to confirm is that General Mkluli and his family benefited to the value of 306,919 rand. That is correct, Chair. And so my question to you, which is now hopefully correctly stated, is did General Mkluli also have access to any other funds for travel arrangements? That is correct, Chair. Um, as stated in my affidavit, he also made use of the normal SAPS budget, in other words, the open account uh, for traveling arrangements, for official, uh, official travel. And he pay and, and the rest of the card, more than 700,000 rand was paid towards uh, his air travel uh, during the period July 2009 uh, to March 2011. Now, uh, now, the travel that he paid for under uh, the open account, uh, do you know whether those were all legitimate official mm -hmm. travels? In respect of the open account? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Chair, I can, only, I can only deal with what is uh, on face value in terms of the documentation presented to me from, from yes, Crime Intelligence. Yes, it appeared to be. Yes, and it, and it looks um, it as looks if it was official travel yes. uh, in terms of the open account. Yes. yes. So, so, would one be able to say for official traveling, he used the open account, and then for uh, traveling that was not authorized or was not lawful, then he used the other one. Or oh, it's difficult to say. Uh, Chair, um, as I said, I mean, it, it's, it is not normal procedure to use this account for your own traveling, especially the position that he held. Yes, he holds. yes. Uh, what I can say is that uh, um, yeah, it, uh, the, when I talk about the family, it doesn't only include his kids, it also in includes his ex-wife together with his brother and his sister. So mm. it is, um, under those circumstances... Could that, be, could, that be, could that have been lawful? No, Chair, it cannot could be not lawful. Have been lawful. They're not police officials. Yes. Not all of them. I'm talking about the children and I think the brother, is, they're not police officials. Yes. And, 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 and uh, in terms of the... 
regulations or policies or conditions under which that account could be used? Is it contemplated that it could be used for family members? No, Chair. It's not, it's, no, it, it, it is it's not, for a specific purpose. It's for specific purposes only, yes, Chair. And, and that's, that's really for, 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 for agents whose identity mustn't be known publicly. That is correct, Chair. Agents or informants, for that matter. Yes, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's why you say it couldn't be him, because he was public. That, that's what I'm saying, yes, Chair. Yes, okay. Did your investigations reveal anything in relation to the African Dream Family Church and the allegations of Colonel Naidu that certain pastors had benefited from flights and accommodation paid for by the Secret Services account? Yes, Chair, I was, um, I do not mention the names here, but I was, in terms of the actual passengers, I was privy to the names and there were um, quite a few pastors and um, clergy that flew on that account um, or that flew and which, uh, which expenses were paid for from the um, SSA account. Um, and it, it, it normally follows with Mr. Lazarus going from, General Lazarus going from either Durban back to Joburg, uh, Johannesburg or coming back. Was any disciplinary action taken against General Lazarus in relation to these allegations? Yes, Chair, in respect of this specific allegations, they were. Uh, and he was, as far as um, um, he was found guilty uh, of misconduct uh, in respect of General Sintimuli and General Machachi. Um, September. Um, Chair, if I may request, What's may I request your indulgence and request a five-minute adjournment Why? Um, in order to address certain matters. Okay. All right. We'll adjourn for five minutes. Thank you, Chair. We adjourn. All rise.
proceed, please. We are indebted to you for the indulgence, Chair. Mr. Rulofsa, the next investigation that you talk to is at page 26 of your affidavit, and it is titled Joe Marks, New World Motors, Procurement of Vehicles. Before you get into the detail of this particular investigation, what, do you know what the procurement process is to acquire vehicles within crime intelligence? Um, Chairperson, it is essentially, say, essentially the same as each, um, as a normal procurement within the open account, um, with the difference that they can source specific vehicles uh, for specific requirements. So it is, there must be the in, there must be a proper motivation uh, for the purchase of a vehicle and um, <clears throat> based on that motivation and the use of that vehicle then the, the vehicle can be can be purchased purchased um, the difference is that they do not they don't go out and tender because they buy vehicle on buy vehicles basically on a um, as the need arises they would buy a vehicle um, for a specific purpose but they also do buy bulk in the sense that they would uh, estimate that they would need, say, 15 or 20 vehicles for that specific year for their members, and that can also happen. So it is, it is, um, it is a process that they follow with the proper paperwork that needs to be in place uh, for the acquisition to take place. Which department within crime intelligence would be tasked with the procurement of motor vehicles? That will be the, the, uh, the SSA account uh, or the unit within the SSA account, the Secret Services account, which fall directly under the uh, general assets. And in particular, to what extent would supply chain management be involved in this process? Um, crime intelligence, uh, the, uh, the, um, they have a unit within the Secret Services account which is, um, which is involved in the, in the supply chain management process of acquiring these vehicles of which, <coughs> sorry, of which um, Colonel Barnard plays an integral role. Is there a particular register that is kept in relation to vehicles purchased by crime intelligence? Chair, when it works like any asset register um, for any state state department, they just call it the secret secret register. If I'm if if I am not mistaken, they use the abbreviation SR. So you would have a SR vehicle, a SR SR furniture. Those all those items would get a number, SR 50, SR 51, whatever the case may be, and that is attached to that specific vehicle as. <coughs> Uh, proof of purchase and um, uh, to account for the actual vehicle or the actual uh, acquisition. Was this particular investigation initiated through information that you obtained through Colonel Naidu or was it initiated in a different way? Chair, this specific investigation um, was initiated by going through the actual documents which we received from Crime intelligence. Um, right in the beginning, as part of our um, agreement, and in in some of the f some of the files, we discovered the name uh, New World Motors, and uh, we could ascertain from those files that New World Motors were um, were involved in the the reparation of vehicles and uh, the servicing of of, of uh, SR vehicles. So based on that, we then continued with the investigation uh, regarding them. Uh, we were able to establish that, and this is what piqued our interest, is the fact that uh, one vehicle would have a re uh, windscreen replacement three, four, five times in a very short period of time, which didn't make sense to us. Um, based on that, I asked my members, who assisted me at the time, to go to New World Motors, um, not as police members, but as a, as a member of the public, and ask whether they can, uh, whether they provide the service of um, replacing windscreens. They came back to me and report back to me that they don't. So that piqued our interest in, in, in New World Motors. Colonel Naidu amplified the information at the later stage when he spoke to me. 
In relation to the inspection that was conducted, if I ask you to turn to page 28, paragraph 83.4, you talk specifically to the date of 23 September 2011. Is that the date on which your team went to visit the premises? That is correct, uh, Chair. That's the date when, uh, when I asked them to go and, and, and um, do that investigation for me, conduct that investigation for me. And then what happened shortly after that day? I requested, because of what we found and because of what my members have told me, I then requested General Henkel uh, that I want to see the financial statements relating to the tra total trade between Company X and New World Motors, um, similar to the one I requested for uh, once of travel and tours or Westville travel. Um, I wanted, as I said, I wanted to establish the trade between the two companies, um, and that would have been for me a good in indicator as to whether or not to pursue that line of inquiry. General Henkel informed me on the following day that he had spoken to General Lazarus regarding my request and that General Lazarus informed him that I'm not entitled to the information relating to New World Motors due to national security issues. Uh, this incident clearly indicated to me, the rid a rid a ridiculous position that I found myself in, in that I had to inquire from the suspect, in this case General Lazarus, uh, whether or not I could get access to documentation needed to either prove or disprove his or others involved in, in this allegation. So, um, and the mere fact that he used the, the term national security issues was actually a, a red flag to me, saying that we are on the right track, we are looking at something that is bothering. Um, bothering him. And then if we go to paragraph 82, you talk about certain information that Colonel Naidu, sorry, Colonel Naidu provided you with in relation to this um, investigation. Can you please inform the Chair of the information that Colonel Naidu provided you with? Colonel Naidu informed me of, the, of a closed tender process. Uh, as part of the Crime intelligence had to sell their vehicles at some stage when it gets boarded. And they used the closed tender process for security reasons, purposes. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that in terms of that. And so a closed tender process is the normal course of business? Uh, with respect to the SR vehicles at the time. In other words, the Secret, uh, the secret Services account vehicles. Because what? you could use the details of that vehicle to, track, to trace back who the, event, who the owner was. So that is why it was, was uh, sold to a, a closed tender process. Okay, please just explain that again. Uh, well, why, why, why should there be secrecy about uh, selling cars that uh, the crime intelligence doesn't need anymore? Chair, if you look on the, when you do a trace on a vehicle, it would uh, it would um, provide you with all the previous owners of that vehicle. So that is what they want to mitigate, the fact that you are, uh, that you would see the previous owners. Because the previous owner is either a member of crime intelligence or an agent, because the vehicle was registered in that person's name, or it is a front company, it was registered in, in the name of a front company. And that is what you want to, you want to mitigate that, um, that risk. Uh, for those members and companies not to be identified. Well, uh, would they normally be registered under the name of someone like an informer, an agent? Uh, Chairperson, yes, it happens. Um, uh, in fact, that's the norm. But if it's registered in the name of SAPS or Crime Intelligence, then there should be no need for secrecy, or should there be? Yeah, if it's, if it's registered in the name of SAPS, or, um, but it cannot be registered in the name of crime intelligence because you, you want to keep the identity, uh, you, want to keep any you want to remove any association with, uh, with, the, with the police service. Uh, you want to, to, to avoid that at all costs because you don't want the agent uh, be associated with the police service. That could compromise him in his work uh, in a project or whatever he needs to do. Well. Um, if whoever tries to trace it won't uh, get to know 
an agent who was using it, or if it wasn't registered in the name of an agent, it was simply registered in the name of SAPS or crime intelligence. That alone should not be a problem, isn't it? Gee, I think... Um, Obviously, crime intelligence has got vehicles. Yes, they do. Yes, um, and and, and uh, I, everybody would expect them to have this, some vehicles in their name. I, I, I'm, what I'm explaining is as what is explained to me and the reasons given uh, as to why it's done, uh, done in that specific way. Um, I understand the, the issue regarding um, uh, taking care of, of people's uh, of people um, the, the agents yeah the agents the, and the and the yeah. uh, and the safety I understand that but uh, as you pointed out it could have been just uh, re-registered to SAPS and then sold it, that could have happened that, yes. but that's not what they did yes that, that's that was asking because I want I wanted to see whether uh, what room there is of abusing the system uh, uh, when there is actually a way which would not reveal the identity of any agent that could be used. Uh, in, as far as, in as far as I know, this system that I'm talking about now has been changed because of the abuse. Yes, okay. So that has been changed. Uh, that is what was, I was informed of that. Uh, yes. Whether that happened or not, that I can't tell. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Now the one that is used now, um, is it more transparent? From what I understand, Chair, it is more transparent, yes. Yes, okay. Is it correct then that the system that you are referring to now is the one that was explained to you by Colonel Naidu? Colonel Naidu at the time when I interviewed him, yes, that is correct, Chair. And when is this that you interviewed him? That was over the course of many months, uh, but the in first interview started, started in October. I think it was as, as I testified the... Uh, the 18th of October, October 2011. So this is certainly about eight years ago. That is correct, Chair. Okay. Please proceed to explain what Colonel Naidu described to you to be the process of procurement for vehicles. Uh, his explanation to me was that they I'm were... I'm sorry, on what page are you now? We are on page 27, Chair. 37. 27. 27, oh. It's the top paragraph. <coughs> He explained to me that, as far as he could recall, or, or, well, as far as I can recall in terms of what he explained to me, there were five uh, bidders in total. The bidders were pre-selected, um, two of which shared directors, members, uh, who are family members of Mr. Joe Marks, of New World Motors. Sorry, if I could just get clarity from you. Who was Mr. Joe Marks relative to New World Motors? Mr. Joe Marks was the owner of New World Motors. Uh, Colonel Naidu indicated that the close tender process, process is a sham as Colonel Barnett and General Lazarus informs Mr. Marks beforehand of the tender amounts from the other bidders. Mr. Marks would then adjust his bid to be just higher than, the other, than that of the other bidders. He would then be awarded the tender and buy the vehicles. At the end of 2011, Mr. Marks had approximately 80 vehicles registered in his name and or New World, New World Merger's name that they, that they bought from Company X as part of this closed tender process. To what extent were you able to verify any of this information through your investigations? Chair, through the certain seizures that we did at the premises of New World Motors, we found certain documentation which would indicate that um, that there was no competitive bidding process that taken place. Um, the companies that um, they, that represented Mr. Marks and his family, uh, there was an actual book that we found where you could see the different amounts uh, penciled into that book uh, for the specific tenders, and that is uh, and, and that's in respect of both of those companies. What information did Colonel Naidu give you in relation to the condition of these vehicles? Uh, Colonel Naidu said that most of these vehicles, well that's his information, most of the vehicles would be, would be sent just prior to the vehicle being boarded to New World Motors. 
when uh, then they will provide extensive um, servicing for that vehicle by put on new tires and uh, service the vehicle properly and then the vehicle would then reset uh, would then be placed on the on the close tender process it would then be it would then be bought by mr marx and that, and at times it would be sold back to the member who drove the vehicle in the first place uh, at a at a discounted price unfortunately because of the documentation that wasn't given to us weren't provided any further to us we were not able to verify that specific allegation regarding that so um but that's part of the allegations that he that he, we were able to identify that they did buy vehicles and that there was a tender process when we stayed and in which they participated was there any information that was given to you in relation to the pricing of these vehicles when they were um, sold or purchased? Uh, Chair, as I alluded to before, the, uh, if it is a member that, that, uh, that is buying his own vehicle, uh, which he used as a Secret Services account vehicle, the amount would be less than, uh, than New World Motors would have paid for it. Uh, if it is a vehicle that they just bought through the close tender process, process with them having the uh, with them selling it on towards someone else, then that amount would also be just higher than than the closest tender, uh, so that they can acquire the vehicle and then sell on to a to a third party at a at a, at a profit. Uh, one second. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So, is it then correctly, uh, correctly stated that the vehicles were sold at inflated cash prices? Yes, that is the information that I received. Um, as I said, I did not receive the documentation from Crime Intelligence to, um, to compare the amounts. What I did receive, um, or what was told to me, is that there were minor repairs uh, done to those vehicles, and the vehicles were in good condition when it was sold to uh, New World Motors. And in this regard, um, the information you received from Colonel Naidu that the cars were sold at inflated prices, were you given any other information as to what happened to the cash surplus? Of yeah the inflated prices paid. yes chair um the inflated prices in, in with regards i was um i was just actually looking at my affidavit now and i forgot about this point at times according to neither these vehicles um colonel neither these vehicles would be sold back to crime intelligence which was just placed in the tender and they would be sold back to crime intelligence at a um at a inflated amount uh, uh. When you say back to crime intelligence, you mean to individuals within crime intelligence? No, no, to the yeah, institution. I'm, I'm now meaning the institution. Yes. Oh, so they they are sold out from the institution, and then later on they are sold back. That is correct, Chair. That's according to information from mm. from from Colonel Naidu. Okay. As I said, I couldn't. Uh, we were able to to corroborate some of this. Yes. Uh, but not everything. But not everything is. Mm. Was there any other information that was given to you as to what that cash surplus was used for? Yes, Chair. Um, according to, as I said, um, I, I will refer the Chair to, uh, to Naidu when, when he says to me something. According to Colonel Naidu, he, the, the surplus has been created, or uh, where there is a surplus created, that money would be utilized um, and I want to make, and I want to take an example. Um, when General Maduli went to Singapore, he received a, an advance amount uh, from the from the Secret Services account uh, in cash, so that he can go and um, so when he leaves, he has cash in, in his pocket, 
uh, where he can, and then he can pay his accommodation. And then when he comes back, he provides the, uh, the necessary invoices to cover that cost. Um, so in some instances, uh, according to Colonel Nider, um, <clears throat> when the senior managers came back from overseas trips like this, and he was specifically referring to General, Nider, General McLuley as well, they would not have the necessary receipts to back up uh, the expenses that they, or the fact that they don't have the money anymore. So they had to devise a, a situation where they had to get, had to, um, uh, they had to, at, 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 how can I put this, they had to um, create a cash for that to be used to pay back uh, the outstanding amount in terms of the advance that was, uh, that was uh, asked for in the first place. So that is one of the instances where, where cash would have been used to cover the, the, uh, the advance that was taken out by the specific member. And in this regard, what uh, Colonel Naidu said, he, as well as other members of crime intelligence did, was to uh, receive fraudulent invoices from New World Motors relating to the repairing of windscreens, uh, where the actual repair didn't take place, but an invoice was provided so that they could put in a claim for the replacement of the window or the windscreen, and that money would then be used to cover the cost of other uh, for, of claims that wasn't paid in full, but that wasn't paid back in full. And so then, to summarize what you've said, and please correct me where I'm wrong, it was the information of Colonel Naidu that vehicles were procured and sold by crime intelligence through a closed process, which was in fact a sham. That is correct, yeah. It's also his evidence that these vehicles were sold at inflated prices, be it to third parties or be it back to crime intelligence. Yeah, he was referring to um, inflated prices back to crime intelligence. Apologies, yes, crime yes. intelligence. But there were instances where it was sold to... Um, the individuals of crime intelligence as well. Yes, at a, at a discounted price. And any surplus that was then derived from these inflated prices did not go to the benefit of crime intelligence, but went to the benefit of others. Uh, it went to the benefit of New World Motors and Mr. Marx as well as others, yes. And those funds were in fact state funds. That is correct, Chair. Yeah. At page 27, paragraph 83.3. Apologies, para page 28, paragraph I'm sorry, Ms. September. Um, the reference to SR, uh, is it nothing more than simply a reference to a secret register? Or is there some other significance about it? Um, Chair, you must excuse me. I'm just using the, the, the language that, oh, the, that, that the you people might from not crime intelligence use. Yes. Oh, okay. So SR would indicate, okay. if I talk about the SR vehicle, if you see that, Chair, then it means that it is a vehicle um, bought through the Secret Services account. Yes. Yeah. Okay. At paragraph 86 of your affidavit, page 28, you refer to another search and seizure warrant that you obtained for execution. Please inform the Chair about this. Um, I have already testified I'm to sorry, this. Ms. September, I thought you wanted to cover 83.3. No, did Chair, you change I'm, your mind? No, no, it was actually 86. Hmm? 86? 86, yes, You have Chair. covered 83.3? We have covered 83.3, Oh, Chair. okay. Okay. You may continue. Thank you, Chair. Um, is it correct that part of the documents that you then seized dealt with the time period that Company X has been in business with New World Motors? 
That is that is correct, Chair. If if I may, Chair, I just want to go back to 83.3. Um, I have testified to the fact that I received certain documentation from Crime Intelligence, and that led me to uh, interrogate uh, New World Motors and the, and the invoices that were submitted as part of those files. Yes. So that, that is where I refer. This is 83.3. Oh, okay. In respect of what I, what yes, I said earlier. Yes, okay, okay. And, and that issue about 83.4 has also been covered. Correct, Chair. About windscreens and so on. Correct, Chair. The order um, okay. of the evidence as it's recorded in the affidavit is told through the prism of how this particular witness went about in establishing his investigation and the information that was then received from Colonel Naidu. Yes. Some of which is not all in the order, unfortunately, as okay. it's been recorded. Okay. And then on page 29, you reference certain concerns in relation to the appointment of particular individuals of uh, in relation to Mr. Marx. That is correct, Chair. Um, uh, Colonel Knight informed me that, uh, that a family member of Mr. Marx was also appointed as a captain within crime intelligence at the time, during that same time frame and during the process. Uh, and I confirmed this with General Hankel. So you independently verified this to be correct? That is correct, Chair. Was there anything wrong for a family member of Mr. Marks to be appointed in crime intelligence? No, Chair, there's not necessarily something wrong with it. it I think that in terms of the, the relationship that, was, uh, that um, happened between crime intelligence and Mr. Marks, um, this should have been disclosed um, to either General Medluri, and I do not know whether it was disclosed or whether it was disclosed to a third party outside crime intelligence, because the relationship are too close for them, um, for this not to be disclosed. New World Motors does business with crime intelligence. General Lazarus is, um, is uh, at the head of the senior uh, Secret Services account who approves these transactions. Mr. Mark is a service provider to crime intelligence. His son gets appointed within crime intelligence, of which General um, Lazarus is the person in charge of the 250 appointment process. And so what you say is based on your conclusions of the events that you had become aware of, but not necessarily factual conclusions of any wrongful or illegal appointment. No, you have to look at this uh, holistically and in terms of the relationship that, that, that has taken place, um, the quid pro quo relationship that has taken place. Because according to Colonel Naidu, uh, General Lazarus and himself also benefited financially from, this, uh, from these transactions in the sense that certain that some of the money that was paid to Naidu uh, or that was created through the, uh, uh, the supplying of false invoices to, crime, to the Secret Service account, some of that cash was shared between him and General Lazarus, according to uh, Colonel Naidu. The next investigation starts on page 29. <coughs> And it's titled General Solomon Lazarus, Promotions and Appointments of Family and Friends to Crime Intelligence. Where did you obtain information in relation to this investigation? Chair, um, the initial information came from, uh, came from Colonel Naidu. And then based on his information, I then requested certain documentation. Uh, and. Um, Colonel Naidu explained his own relationship also to me um, in, in relation to this, this incident. Uh, now, he said to me that he, is, he got to know Lazarus through playing volleyball in the volleyball in the late 90s in KZN. They used to, say, to play in the same league in Tongat. Colonel Naidu was promoted from being a warrant officer to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel 
by general licenses through the COVID adver adver um, advertisement process, the 250 posts that, we, that, that I was referring to earlier in 2010. He was not only a member of CI who got promoted, he was not the only member who got promoted in such a way. Various others, other close confident, confidants and family members of General Assets also got either promoted or appointed in senior positions without following due process. General Assets was also intimately involved in the appointment of family and friends, whereas he should have recused himself from that specific process. And then I went and I tried to uh, and, I've, and, and I requested information regarding the appointments. And the table, which is table two as part of my affidavit, it then sets out the, uh, the various um, uh, appointments and in which rank they were appointed. Uh, and in, in, these, in respect of this, you'll see that the relationship, uh, in, t in the column of the relationship, I would then use the, the, um, the number F from one FM10, and in his instance, it will be FM10 to FM12. So your investigations had verified that there were 12 individuals who had been appointed through the 250, co 250 posts process, who were then either family or friends of General Lazarus. That's correct, uh, Chair. I can include colleagues as well, uh, but when I talk about family and friends, it includes colleagues uh, with which he was friends. And if we can just look to this table, which starts on page 29. The first column is titled Relationship. The second column is Status. And what exactly do you mean by status? By status, I mean at the time when I drew up this column, and, um, and it was now for the purpose of this, uh, uh, this commission, I, um, I was able to gain access to the pass-up system, which would, which would then show me the individuals involved. So the status column would then state that at the time when I did this, the person was active. In other words, still working within the South African Police Service. The next column is the date of appointment in rank, followed by a column titled rank, next column level, following column date of promotion slash appointment in rank, followed by another column called rank, and the last column on the right hand side which is level. Now, when you're referring to rank, is that then the rank as you indicated under Annexure 1 to your affidavit, which you addressed earlier today? That is correct, Chair. If I can just be um, of more assistance, if you look at the date of appointment in rank, uh, the first date, this would mean that that person was already appointed within SAPS on the 1st of March 2001. Just for clarity of the record, are you referring to the third column? I am. I'm referring to the third column, and I'm, and I'm referring to FM06 yes. as an example. That person was appointed as an admin clerk on a level 6. And that was on the 1st of March 20, sorry, 2001. 2001, that is correct, Chair. On the 15th of February, as part of this process, the 250 process, that person was appointed as a captain on a level 8. And do, do you know whether that means he jumped from admin clerk to captain or he did go through other ranks but he, he didn't reflect them? Chair, in, the, in respect of this, he, he jumped uh, at least one rank. So on at in, least in one terms rank? Of, yeah, in terms of what is stated here, yes. he jumped at least one rank. Okay. If we look at the, the next line item, which is FM07, can you take us through that as an example too, please? Uh, as a result of this one, it is, uh, he was appointed on the 1st of August 2005 as a captain on the level 8. On the 1st, March, 1st of March 2010, he was appointed as a colonel on a, level of, on, on a level 12, which means he jumped basically four levels. And uh, that's uh, a completely unusual jump. That is correct, Chair. Yeah. Okay. 
And by way of a last example, if we look at line item number four, FM04, can you take us through that? Because in the third column, it appears blank. That is correct, Chair. So uh, in respect of this specific individual, he or she was an individual, I mean a civilian, and who was appointed to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, which is in the level 10, on the 1st of March 2010. So that means that one didn't go through the ranks at all? No, Chair. He or she didn't. He or she any jumped everything. That's correct. Until yes. And, and that's, uh, is it about uh, rank number 567 from the bottom? Uh, it starts, if I'm not mistaken, it starts at level 3. Oh. Uh, the ranks within, or the levels within SAPS. Yes, no, what I'm thinking is uh, if you start from constable. How many ranks do you I have to check. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It requires uh, actual counting. It's six ranks. Um, uh, six ranks. Six, yes. Okay, all right. If one were then to consider the full table, which starts on page 29 and ends on page 30, is it correct that other than FM11, where there is a retention of a rank at level 10. The remaining individuals have either jumped from a lower rank to a much higher rank, alternatively have been appointed into a senior rank um, as a civilian. That is correct, Chair. And it's correct that you confirmed these appointments? Yeah, I, I confirmed these appointments on the, on the PASAP system um, prior to my, me finalizing my affidavit. The next investigation that you deal with is titled General Lazarus, Abuse of Safe House. That is correct, Chair. How did you come to learn of, this, of the allegations underpinning this investigation? Uh, Chair, uh, Chair, it is again General, um, Colonel Nider that informed me of, uh, of this incident. At the time, General uh, Colonel Nider was um, uh, travelled with General Lazarus and they were in close contact with each other. Uh, they also stayed in more or less the same vicinity. Um, <clears throat> according to, General, according to Colonel, Liz uh, Colonel Nider, General Lazarus um, did some extensive renovations to his private property. To such an extent that he couldn't stay there anymore. Uh, he had to vacate the premises. And during what period was this? This was, this was during 2005-2006. Uh, he then stated to me that the rental amount was approximately 6,000 rand per month. And according to Colonel Nader, he was responsible for paying the rent out of the Secret Services account. Who was responsible? Colonel Nidu was responsible. In other words, he had to withdraw money from the Secret Service account, pay it, and then uh, provide the invoice to cover the cost of the payment. Uh, he's, he states further that the premises were rented only for the period that General Lazarus and his family made use of it, and it, it, and it was exclusively furnished, furnished from monies from the Secret Service account. After the lease period expi had expired, the furniture was written off. The furniture was still in excellent condition, and Colonel Nider and General Lazarus took some of the furniture for themselves. According to Colonel Nider, General Lazarus took various items, including mirrors, coffee, lamp, coffee tables, and lamps, for himself. I then requested uh, crime intelligence at the time when I was still allowed to get documentation. Uh, to confirm whether this rental take took place or not, I was, pres I was uh, given the actual documentation. I was able to corroborate what um, Colonel Nido has told me. It was for approximately one year uh, that General Lazar stayed there. Um, the Secret Service account was responsible for the maintaining of the garden, the DSTF here, or DSTV, and other expenses within the household of uh, General Lazar at the time. Uh, 
That is as far as I can take it at this point in time, Chair. Is there any prohibition against a member of the police using a safe house for personal benefit? Chair, the correct procedure is the following. If there's, if there's a threat on your life, and whether you work for crime intelligence, whether you work for uh, the commission, or whether you work for SAPS, uh, a risk assessment needs to be done, uh, and that is done by crime intelligence. Based on that risk, ex risk assessment, a decision will be taken whether um, uh, it is required for that person to be protected. And whether that protection means personal protection or protection at his home, uh, it doesn't actually, it, 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 it's the same thing. When it comes to protection at home, the correct procedure after that is that you have to engage the Department of Public Works, who would then, based on the decision that there is a threat, uh, make sure that the, that the necessary um, security upgrades has been, has been, or has been done to your home uh, in as far as um, the, th the threat exists. That is what is supposed to happen. Um, I could not find any security threat that was part of the documentation that I produced, that was given to me. So I could not find any evidence that there was a security threat or security risk on Mr. Lazarus. And even if there were, the funds should have come from somewhere else uh, and not the Secret Services account for the payment of that property. But now there is a marked distinction between benefiting from a safe house and obtaining <coughs> funds in relation to an upgrade for security reasons. The is that true? No, that is true, but the process would still be the same. This, the funds that you would need to cover the cost of a rental as part of your, as par, as part of your safety pr pr procedures um, comes from the open account, not the Secret Services account. And you have to have a proper motivation as to why, and there must be a risk assessment as to why you have to stay somewhere else. And in this case, the motivation does not speak to uh, the, the reason as to why Mr. Lazarus, uh, the actual reason according to Naidu, Colonel Naidu, as to why Mr. Lazarus stayed there. But then is it correct that, or rather let me ask you the question, are there any instances where state funds from the Secret Services account can be used to house a member of the police? Chair, if it is for official purposes, then um, it is possible. But it is highly unlikely because you would not have policemen staying at, uh, at, that, at that premises. That premises has been utilized for something else. It's been utilized for um, conducting your work, uh, <coughs> seeing informers, uh, seeing agents, and that kind of thing. It's so not you can't it's not live in it? No, Chair, you can't live in it. You it's can not go this. there for meetings or whatever operations, but you can't live in it uh, as a member of the police. No, Chair, you can't, because then you're benefited from benefiting from, from that safe house in your personal capacity. Yes, yes. And uh, you're not allowed to do that. The next thing, or rather, what's the status of this investigation, Mr. Rulof, sir? Um, this investigation was dealt with. Um, it was dealt with, and, and, uh, and we received the, the documentation relating to this. Uh, the documentation has not been declassified. The next investigation that you deal with is titled General Lazarus, Abuse of SSA, we, Purchasing we for of Vehicles. Yes. Maybe now is an opportune time. Yes, we will stop uh, with your evidence, Mr. Lufse, now, and we'll proceed tomorrow uh, at 10. Chief, before we do, with your leave, um, I'd like to place it on record that Colonel Naidu is in fact a witness 
who will be called by the commission. By virtue of the fact that he's been placed under the witness protection program, there is an application that will be brought before you, Chair, in due course. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether you should proceed uh, with that matter. Uh, and um, uh, we are going to adjourn. Uh, you can approach me in chambers uh, in regard to the other matter. We are going to adjourn um, uh, for now. It may or may not be that we'll resume to deal with another matter or I might deal with it in chambers. As it pleases, Chief. We adjourn. All rise.